Today we will be beginning a four-part mini-series in Scripture Snack based off of the topic of forgiveness. And this is part one of our four-part series on forgiveness. And the title of this Scripture Snack is, Why Should I Forgive? Why should I forgive? Do I have to do it just unconditionally? Do I have to do it just because Jesus says so and I don't really have to like it? What should be the motivation behind my forgiveness? That's the goal with this week's Scripture Snacks, to be able to understand the question and answer a little bit better. And Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32 is the chief text that we're going to be looking at, or the chief verse that we're going to be looking at for part one of our Scripture Snack series on forgiveness. And verse 32 of chapter 4 says this, Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. And I have three comments or observations based off of that verse. And the first observation is this. Is that this verse in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, this verse is a command. This entire verse is a command. And oftentimes we look at some of the the statements that the Apostle Paul makes or that Jesus Christ himself makes throughout the Gospels and the New Testament. And we look at those statements or instructions that Jesus or Paul or any other writer gives, and we look at those commands and we say, those are optional. Those are for the hyper-spiritual Christians, and those would be very, very helpful commands for us to abide by. But if I don't follow those commands, even to a T, and I do mess up every so often, and I'm imperfect in following those commands that the New Testament explicitly gives to me, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that big of a deal. Because I'm a fallen person, and life is really hard, and people get on my nerves sometimes, and those commands, yes, I would like to accomplish them. I'd like to abide by them as much as I possibly can. But if I do not, no big deal. And that's simply not what the Bible says. Because this verse, as we're looking at here, it says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. These are commands. And to not be defined by a life of kindness or a life of being compassionate to one another or a life of forgiveness, and to not be kind, and to not be compassionate, and to not forgive other people who've hurt us, you would be sinning to not do those things. These are commands. The you here is implied. You be kind. You be compassionate. You forgive people who have hurt you and done you wrong. And to not do so is a sin that needs to be repented of. So the first thing that we have to understand is to not abide by these principles that scripture gives us would be to sin. And we get to joyfully abide by these principles because this is the key to fullness of life. A life of kindness, a life of compassion, a life of forgiveness. God tells us to do these certain things for a certain reason. And that reason is so that we can have fullness of life in Christ because the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy, Jesus says in John 10, 10. But I have come that you may have life and life abundantly. And how we have that life and how we experience Christ's abundance is through obeying his commands. He has told us these things so that his joy may be in us and that our joy may be full. These commands he has given us are for our joy. Be kind to one another. Be compassionate to one another. Forgive other people when they've hurt you. That's the key to a life permeated with joy. To not do so is to violate a command of God, which is sin. So out of our forgiveness in Christ, out of the fact that we've been forgiven, we get to go out and to live these things now by the power of God's Spirit that dwells within us. Because without God's Spirit dwelling within us, these are actually impossible. Being kind and compassionate and offering true forgiveness in an eternal sense, kindness that lasts forever and compassion that truly lasts into eternity, and forgiveness that really matters, to do those things without being indwelt by the Holy Spirit and being a forgiven person yourself, those things are impossible. And we will get to that later on in our series here, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, Now notice something about Jesus here. 
throughout his ministry on earth, he was filled with compassion, the Bible says, multiple times. And whenever Jesus was filled with compassion, what followed immediately after was action. His compassion always turned into action. And this is documented here for us in Matthew chapter 14, which says these words. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them. And he just stopped and sat down and ate a sandwich. And the verse is over. No, it's not. His compassion resulted in something. It said he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. He did something with his compassion. If you're just doing something for people and you don't have compassion on them, you might be sinning by doing them. You might actually be committing a sin by healing people because you do not truly care about them and your work does not proceed from faith in God or love for others. And therefore, it's a dead work. It's dead weight. And those type of works are despicable to the Lord. They're like filthy rags before the Lord. But if you just have compassion, and that's all you did, that's all you have, and it does not follow, if it is not followed by action, well, what good is that? <laughs> what good is that? You have to act on your compassion, like Jesus frequently did in his ministry. He healed their sick in this context. In fact, a few verses later, he feeds 5,000 people, plus women and children, so roughly around 20,000 people, some project. Jesus' compassion for others always resulted in action for others. No dead compassion for Jesus. He never had dead compassion. We did not follow such compassion with action. He felt empathy and he felt bad for other people and the situations that they were in, and he acted on that compassion. No dead compassion with Jesus, and we should have no dead compassion named among us either. And 1 John chapter 3, verse 17 through 18 gets at that notion when it says this in verse 17. It says, If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, so you can't claim ignorance here. Just, just to pause in the verse here. You can't claim that you didn't see your brother or your sister. Just like in the parable of the Good Samaritan, when the priest and the Levite are walking down the road from uh, to Jericho from Jerusalem, and vice versa, I forget how it goes, but they see the person, the, Samar uh, uh, the person that was beaten half dead and he's on the side of the road. They see the person and they walk on the other side of the road. And they basically just cover their ears and they go, la, 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 la. I don't see you. You don't exist for one second. <laughs> but beloved, they saw the man who was lying half dead on the side of the road. They could not claim ignorance. And when we see people that are in need around us, we cannot claim ignorance either. The rest of the verse says this, If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, in other words, has no compassion on such people who are in need, if that person does not have pity, if we do not have pity on brothers or sisters in need, how can the love of God be in that person? How can it be in that person? Not just how might it be in that person or how should it be in that person. How can it literally be in such a person? It can't. The love of God has no place in such a person who does not feel compassion for the needs of others. Verse 18 continues, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. In other words, feel compassion in verse 17. Verse 18, follow that with action. Act upon such an emotional conviction. Act on them. Don't just have verse 17 without verse 18. And don't, excuse me, it's not even possible to have verse 18 without verse 17. You must have compassion as a prerequisite for loving people with right action and with truth. That's the command from Christ. Second observation is this. Paul assumes that forgiveness will be needed. He assumes that forgiveness will be needed. Again, in Ephesians 4, verse 32, Paul says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. <laughs> forgiving each other. That's how kindness and compassion works itself out within a Christian community. Paul knows that even the church in Ephesus that he's writing to, who he praises again and again and again at the opening chapter 
during the opening chapter of his letter, he praises them, but he knows that they're not perfect. He knows that conflict and strife will inevitably arrive within the Ephesian church, and therefore forgiveness must take place. Forgive each other. Even Christians are messed up people who need to forgive and to be forgiven. And if you're honest with yourself, and you can look in the mirror today, you must acknowledge the fact that you have needed to ask for forgiveness from other people, even if you, if you should be asking for forgiveness right now. Maybe you have a long debt with somebody that's coming to your mind that you must ask forgiveness. You must ask their forgiveness as soon as you can. And you've also had to forgive other people who have hurt you. And you've had to forgive from the bottom of your heart, not just paying lip service to forgiveness and saying, I forgive you, but then harboring bitterness in your heart against them. No, 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 no. Because that's not, not how we would like to be forgiven, is it? We want people to forgive us from their hearts. And vice versa, we need to forgive other people from our hearts. That's what true forgiveness looks like, and that's how it manifests itself in the church and in the world abroad. Forgive each other. And Paul assumes that even within a, a quote-unquote spotless Christian community, he knows that forgiveness is will need to be meted out every now and again. So don't be surprised when we have to forgive people. And don't be surprised when we mess up and we need to ask forgiveness too. So humble yourself and do it. Finally, my third observation is this. The forgiveness that God has given us, that same forgiveness we should give to others. That's the same forgiveness that we should give to others. The end of the verse, verse 32, says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. That's the ground of our forgiveness of other people. We recognize just how sinful and depraved and wretched that we truly are at our core. And we see that. And we see how God forgave us in Christ, not counting our sins against us. And we look at that and we say, God, thank you. Thank you for your grace. I, I'm not worthy of your unmerited favor on my behalf. We accept it and we take his grace and we run with it. Therefore, that same grace that God has given us, we also should give and distribute freely to others. My closing question is this. How exactly did God in Christ forgive us? How did God in Christ forgive you? What does that look like? How did that work itself out? Well, that question we'll be addressing in part two of our next scripture snack.